Greetings from quarantine once again, Front Stretch folks. Davey Siegel on behalf of Front Stretch. You can read it right there. And as you see, to my left, probably your right, Brian Nolan, my compadre over at Front Stretch. We're here to break down everything that we saw yesterday at Kentucky Speedway. Let's start with the end because that was the best part of it. Uh, we get a green white checkered finish in regulation. Kevin Harvick leading Martin Tricks Jr. to his inside. Ryan Blaney coming off a turn four makes a bonsai move down in the inside on the front stretch, makes some contact with Kevin Harvick, and out of nowhere, from the top rope in the top lane, Cole Custer comes out and wins the damn race. I don't even know how that still happened, and I watched it probably 30 times by now. What did you think when you saw the whole thing went down? First off, Davey, in the words of you, what is going on, party people? I mean, it was a party with this original green-white checkered. It wasn't an overtime green-white checkered, but it was literally like a Rey Mysterio off-the-top rope uh, some uh, move that features in the WWE. I mean, Custer with the big push from Matt Benedetto went four wide, beating his teammate in Kevin Harvick, outlasting Martin Truex. I mean, it was – I was – at work and I was literally screaming at the TV. Are you serious? Like I cannot believe what was happening. It was, it was craziness. Yeah. So I'm, I'm watching the race on a um, smart TV. So it's like okay. two minutes behind, uh, which is yeah. so mm -hmm. super annoying. Oh yeah. So I see everything happening on Twitter beforehand. And I actually heard Jeff Gluck say that he listens to it on PRN or MRN. So that way he like gets the live action. So I was following it on Twitter all race long. So I kind of know what happens before I actually see it. And I'm also on the virtual media center online. Mm -hmm. When I saw everybody saying Cole Custer wins, I'm like, N no, They're like there's no chance. It's, it's not possible. I mean, we haven't seen this in a long, long time. I mean, Cole Custer, he won seven Xfinity races last year. We know that he has the talent to get it done. But you look at his results so far this season in the Cup Series – They've been dismal. I mean, he had a top five finish the weekend prior to Indy, but that was his first one. And he's the first rookie since 2007 in Juan Pablo Montoya to win a non-range-shortened race. Like, this does not happen that often. And before him, it was Denny Hamlin in 06. You had Chris Buescher in 20, what was it, 14, 13, 16? The Pocono race. And Joey Logano in 2009 in the yeah. But rookies don't win in the Cup Series that often, especially – full-time ones that are legit victories. So when we saw this, I literally was in disbelief because we haven't seen this in a while. Exactly. Two things. One, you were talking about how you're like two minutes behind. The radio station I work at, they actually have the, the – it's kind of the old school now. They got cable still. So I was – actually watching it in real time which is something I, i'm not used to watching so i was watching in real time and i was just shocked and then two you're talking about this rookie class we all thought it was gonna be tyler reddick getting the getting the victory done first yeah. we did not think it was gonna be cole custer i mean the amount of uh, hype and the just the amount of uh, expectation for this rookie class was huge and it wasn't tyler reddick it was cole custer still in this victory and like you were saying uh davy the results have not been there when we expected the second Stuart Haas card to get to victory lane, a lot of people were thinking it would be Eric Amarola. I mean, he's been dominant. He was dominant at Pocono. He was getting the job done in stage one, and then his car was falling off. And then Clint Boyer, I mean, he's just had a really abysmal season. We did not think it was going to be Cole Custer. This is a huge shocker. Yeah. I don't think it's on the level of Justin Haley last year at Daytona yeah. shocker. But yeah. It's, it, was, it was still up there. I mean, he was 250 to 1, 300 to 1. At some sports books pre race. So if you put in a, a hearty hundred bucks, you probably cashed out big time. Ooh, yeah. You mentioned Eric Almarola. Um, I think his day kind of encapsulates the problem that we saw at Kentucky, whether or not it's the package, whether or not it's the track, whether or not it was just a mix smash hodgepodge of everything negative that was coming together at the right time, or in this case, the worst time. I mean, there's no bones about it. There's no real beating around the bush. Yesterday's race was terrible. Like, yeah, it was bad. Before the finish, the, the finish was outstanding. Incredible finish. I'll give him that, and, and I admit that. But the first 240 or so laps, they, oh, it was awful. Like, it was it's, it was I, I can't even find another word to describe it. It was just what people say about this package sometimes. It's just slot car racing. And I saw somebody tweet basically like, you know, people that always say, oh, NASCAR is just going around in a bunch of circles for three hours. That crowd, like watching the first 240 laps, that's what we saw. Mm -hmm. I mean, there was rarely any real passing. The first green flag pass for the lead, I think, happened towards the end of stage two. Ryan Blaney. Ryan Blaney got by Almarola because 
when Amarola had clean air, he was leading for over 120 something laps. Led 128 and because of because of cautions that were somewhat suspect, made restarts, which we know are the the crux of this package that make it so entertaining at times. And even those cautions were you know questionable and suspect at best. I just want to get your thoughts on it because, in my opinion, there's no real beating around the bush that this race was bad. There's one word I would describe this race, and it's one of my favorite guys on the NBA on TNT, Charles Barkley. He would say, terrible. it's terrible. It was terrible. <laughs> I mean, there's no it's answer but about it. When Jeff, when Jeff Gluck releases his poll on was this a good race, I want, them, I want the people to vote on the overall race, not just the finish, because like you said, the finish was great. The finish was fantastic. The overall, the 265 laps – Leading up to this point, terrible. I mean, it was just absolutely awful. Look at Eric Amarola. One time for 128 laps. You know why? He was out front. He was – clean air is so dominant. Like Clint Boyer said, this package sucks. When you're behind someone, you have all that dirty air, and you have nothing – you can't get around anybody because the dirty air is just clogging your your uh, momentum. It's just you, – you're just stuck. And like you are saying, the stock car people that think they they just go on left turns um, every single Sunday – well, they were right in this case because it was it was bad. It was truly bad from lap one to two sixty five. Yeah, Clint Boris said on the radio a few times, like very frustrated, just saying, "I'm stuck. I can't go anywhere." And Rodney Childers told Kevin Harvick under caution, I think before he took the lead on the inside, basically saying, "Like, look, like everybody's stuck everywhere. You can't pass." And he used some expletives in there as well. But it, it's just really frustrating too. And besides the besides the package talk, because I know. Personally, I get tired of it, and I know people do too. The uh, track but, itself, yeah. I mean, we had two Xfinity races, an ARCA race, a truck race that was shortened by rain, and a cup race. So you had five races at Kentucky Speedway this weekend. Can you tell me that any of them were really worthwhile? I mean, truly. The truck race, we only got halfway, so we didn't see everything. But the stuff that we saw wasn't earth-shattering. The ARCA race had 17 cars or so. And, I mean, any any series that has that car count, the, the show is not going to be – ultra entertaining especially in the state that arc is in now the xfinity races were two pretty boring races won by the same car who was clearly dominant and the cup race as we said was a ride around slot parade for 240 laps i mean why should we go back to kentucky next year tell me why noah gregson's pr rep uh casey herschel said it best stop going to places where they have to apply the pj1 on in the turns because if you can't if you have to apply the pj1 what's the racetrack doing in itself i mean it was just a snooze fest starting on thursday night leading up to saturday or sunday afternoon i mean no ifs ands or buts about it and even the truck race who we think is most people including myself think is the best race out of the entire weekend that wasn't even the best i mean it got it was literally shortened right after the second stage because of monsoon weather that just easy, even wasn't a good show. So I, I don't know what they can do with Kentucky. Maybe go back to nighttime racing. But even then, the Xfinity boys went in nighttime, still nothing. Maybe it's just a track. I don't know. It, it was just a bad weekend overall. I'll tell you what they can do to Kentucky. Leave. Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, the racetrack, I mean, the racetrack in itself is awesome. I went there last year, and, the, and it's in the middle of nowhere. So it's really cool. But the racing's bad. It's just bad. I mean, I, I was listening to The Teardown this morning, which is a podcast on The Athletic, and they basically were like, look, the racing's not good. What are you getting out of it market-wise? It's close to Cincinnati, but it's also close to Indianapolis. So mm-hmm. people that want to see a race in that area of the country, they can go to Indianapolis, go to Michigan. Mm-hmm. It's, it's not doing anything for me. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was okay when the package was different and before they repaved the place and it was a little bumpy and it had some character and there were multiple grooves, but it's really just not doing anything for me. UPS uses it as like a storage facility. Like you saw all those <laughs> with Amazon, semis, yeah. like in the infield. I'd say UPS could just buy the thing and NASCAR could yeah. never go back. I mean, but. yeah. The fans, the fans that were there last year that I interacted with, they were awesome. They were pumped. And yeah. it was a better show last year than it was this year. But, I mean, there's much better racetracks, preferably short tracks, that yeah. I would rather have them go to than Kentucky. Yeah. Well, uh, let's stop trashing Kentucky because that's okay. not what we came here to do. Okay. Uh, but I want to talk briefly about what we're going to see on Wednesday night, which Ooh. hopefully is going to be – I shouldn't say hopefully. Definitely will be better than what we saw on Sunday at Kentucky, and that is the all-star race at Bristol Motor Speedway. 30,000 fans scheduled to be in attendance. Hopefully everybody will remain safe and cautious. Wear your masks, people. Fingers crossed. Um, But this is the first time that the all-star race is going to be held somewhere other than Charlotte since, I believe, 1998. Um, And it's going to be a a heck of a show. I'm excited to see the underglow on the cars, although I don't know if it's going to be – 
as prevalent as we saw at Champions Week because Bristol is extremely well lit. I'm not excited to see the slid back numbers on the doors because I am not a fan of that. But the all-star race is time for experiments, which is underglow, numbers slid back on the doors, and of course, the choose cone rule. So we will see that in effect as well on Wednesday. Cole Custer is now locked into the all-star race. I think you have a little bit under 20 drivers that are locked in, and you'll have a few that race their way in with the open and, of course, the fan vote. I think Bubba Wallace is probably a shoe in for that as of now of this recording on Monday afternoon. Brian, your quick thoughts on what we should expect to see from the All-Star race on Wednesday. A couple things. It, I'm, I'm disappointed that it has taken a pandemic for NASCAR to switch it up in the, All-Star, in the All-Star format, to go to a short track instead of Charlotte, to go use the underglow that we never thought or even <laughs> – lot of to do that and yes I'm with you I don't like the numbers being on being a little smaller and on the quarter panels but like people are saying it's the all-star race let's switch it up let's change something now is the year this is the year to do something I'm pumped I mean I'm looking at the four stages 55 laps 35 35 and 15 this is gonna be a fast race the open 35 35 15 this is gonna go by fast there's gonna be beaten there's gonna be banging and they got nothing to lose I mean they're going all out it's gonna be it could be a crash fest. It could be beating and banging, going to the line, spinning out on the way to the checkered flag. I'm pumped. Plus, it's on a weeknight. Oh, man. What's better than a weeknight race in Davey? Nothing. I exactly. love weeknight. Like, my point exactly. Too. And, oh, by the way, winner gets a hearty $1 One million. million. Beautiful. $1 million. No. And the best thing, I'm looking at the weather, 91 degrees and sunny. No rain in the forecast. Let's hope it stays that way because yeah. Bristol, I, I've experienced bad weather at Bristol and having to leave early and it's not fun. So hopefully the fans are in attendance, wear their max, masks and do not have any precipitation that precedes them in the forecast over at Bristol. But Brian, thank you for recapping Kentucky with me. I'm glad that we're on the same page that we never want to go back there. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, and um, I'm sure that you'll be watching the All-Star Race oh, this you know it. night on Fox Sports 1 from Bristol Motor Speedway. Be sure to support us at Front Stretch on Patreon. Follow us on all the different social media accounts and subscribe to the EC YouTube channel as well. For Brian, I am David, and we'll catch you on the flip side. Later, guys.